If I started on time, you think I was an imposter? I didn't intend this to be a speech on international copyright as such, if that's uh, some of the points raised here raise general questions about international copyright. Maybe that's something we should handle in a, in a separate meeting. The, uh, the basic point of my comments will really to bring you up to date on what happened uh, between June 5th and 7th in Geneva. The basic function of any international copyright convention is really to serve as a bridge between countries. No international copyright treaty or convention extends the law of any country to the territory of another country. Essentially, all they do is make works emanating in one country, either through authorship or through publication, eligible for protection in another country. And generally, that protection is granted on the basis of what's called national treatment or the same rules of the country in which protection of sword applies to its own nationals. In addition, it's traditional in copyright conventions, particularly multilateral conventions, to assure certain rights under the convention itself. So we have these two basic rights, rights of national treatment and rights granted by the convention. In the case of the Berne Conventions, the rights granted by the conventions themselves generally comprise certain rights of broadcasting, rights of performance, a certain basic minimum term of copyright, and certain rules governing <coughs> the exploitation of those rights. Throughout the years of the revision program in the United States, one of the stated aims was to bring our law into closer harmony with the requirements of the Berne Convention in order to pave the way for United States adherence to that treaty. As domestic revision went its way through the judicial process in this country, it seems we got a little bit further and further from that goal due to the nature of the political compromises that had to be made. With the passage of the new American law on October 19th of 76, attention was again focused on the degree to which we had, in fact, achieved some degree of harmony with the requirements of Bern. At the request of WIPO, the World Intellectual Property Organization, bet uh, between the 5th and 7th of June, a group of experts from various burned countries were invited, together with the Register of Copyrights and myself, to discuss the extent to which the new American law was harmonious with the principles of the Berne Convention. The representatives at the meeting were invited in their individual capacity as experts and did not represent their countries. And that will be left for a later stage in the proceedings. It was a rather blue ribbon panel, which appeared in Geneva on those days with the, many of the famous names in international copyright. Mr. Carabert from France, Mr. Ndaye from Sen Senegal, Ivor Davis from the United Kingdom, Frank Keyes from Canada, Joseph Fixor from Hungary, Mr. Balakrishna from India, Antonio Chavez from Brazil, and two of the grand old men, grand old people, who happen to be men <laughs> of international copyright, uh, Eugene Ulmer from the Federal Republic of Germany and Vittorio De Sanctis from Italy. The WIPO Secretariat was represented by the Director General, Arpad Bosch, assisted by Claude Mazier, the Chief of their Copyright Division, and <coughs> Mr. Ali Khan, the Chief of their Information Division. Also present was Mr. William Wallace, a long time and well-known copyright expert from the United Kingdom, who was there as a technical advisor to the Director General of WIPO. Unfortunately, notwithstanding the fact that we started out with this blue ribbon panel, uh, Mr. Ulmer took sick after the first day and returned to Germany and was not there for the next two days. And Mr. Caravere and Ivor Davis left before the final session due to the pressure of other business. And uh, as I'll mention later, the significance of what occurred in the final session made their absence all the more significant. There were a few general trends that uh, could be mentioned at the outset that actually came through the meeting before getting into the specifics. First, the general attitude of the developed countries represented at the meeting by experts was clearly such as 
Well, the Ratu was generally one of, please, let's not reopen the entire Berne Convention to further revisions. Uh, there's a definite fear of reopening the Berne Convention to full-fledged discussion of amendments, which would undoubtedly lead to a situation where the developing countries would again come in and probably demand further concessions, as they did in 1961 and earlier. Uh, Mr. Bosch made it quite clear, even in the presence of the representative of Mr. Balakrishna from India and Mr. Ndai from Senegal, that this was something which just could not happen at this point, a full-fledged reopening of the Berne Convention. At the same time, the Register and I made it quite clear to the experts that what we'd accomplished in the new American copyright law would have to stay status quo for quite a while, and that we could not reopen our revision program for further amendments. It would just be politically impossible at this point to go back to Congress and say, well, let's start again with this amendment, that amendment, and the like. So there was agreement on, apparent agreement on both sides, that neither the U.S. The US law could not be open for further amendments, and that the Berne Convention itself should not be open to full-scale uh, reconsideration. Another general trend that emerged was an acknowledgment that the laws of many Berne countries, countries which are now members of, Bern, of the Berne Union, are not in full-fledged harmony with the requirements of the Berne Convention. You can look at certain provisions of the French law and the Italian law and the like and say, well, this doesn't meet four square with the requirements of Berne. And uh, it's clear that the laws of a number of other Berne countries are pretty far away from Berne, for example, the Philippines. But at the same time, it was recognized that we're not talking about the Philippines or France or Italy or Germany. We're talking about the United States. And simply by reason of the visibility of the United States and its, uh, its major significance in world commerce and world copyright, that anything done would be examined with closer attention than would otherwise be the case. Uh, I think in my own view is probably beneficial if the Berne countries are willing to interpret the way provisions of the Berne Convention just to satisfy the aims of the United States. It well, it might be that it's not a convention that would be worth adhering to because if they could do it for us, then each other country involved in the Berne Convention could say, well, hell, we can pretty much do the same thing when called upon to grant protection in their country. So the visibility of the United States and the particular attention that would be paid to the compatibility of our law and the requirements of Bern was a, a theme that resounded throughout the three days. Another aspect of this was uh, our making it clear to the assembled experts that we simply could not be in the position of going back to Congress and requesting advice and consent to a treaty where we did not believe our law was in conformity. Uh, it's something we would not do, something the State Department would not do, and it was just out of the question. A third general trend, and getting close to the specifics of the issue, was that most of the experts tend to look at the U.S. law as generally compatible with Bern on a, on a broad overall basis. This is not to say that they were willing to uh, close their eyes or duck any issues of incompatibility that might arise. It's just that it was a willingness to interpret things a certain way. But there were some uh, individuals who sort of stood out from this position. As expected, uh, Mr. Caravere from France was the one whose attitude could be described as the most negative, but not as bad as it could have been or as bad as we thought it was or would likely to be. Uh, we did expect the French and still expect the French to take a negativistic approach towards our adherence to Bern for a number of reasons. Uh, the French still view Bern as historically their convention. Uh, their legal system is entirely different from ours, and he would be injecting Anglo-American concepts further into interpretation of Bern than had been the case previously. There's also something of an attitude of, look, the United States for years was one of the biggest international copyright pirates around, and we were until the development of the Chase Act. And for years they didn't adhere to Bern, they built up the UCC for their own benefit, uh, they never developed their law in harmony with Byrne. They sneaked in through the back door of simultaneous publication. Why the heck should we bend over backwards to accommodate their interests? 
I think this is probably a fully justifiable attitude, and at least a fully understandable one. And I think we have to hear more from the French in the future, from France as a country. Again, Mr. Carabert was there only as an individual expert, and from some of the non-governmental organizations, such as CISAC, who are heavily influenced and dominated by uh, French-speaking nationals and French legal traditions. The representatives of the United Kingdom and Canada, their attitudes could generally be described as uh, optimistic but cautious. They were very concerned, perhaps more than some of the others, about the legalities of the situation. When we discussed different ways of interpreting different matters, uh, Mr. Keyes and Mr. Davis, while generally favorable towards interpretations which would bring our law in harmony with Byrne, were the ones who rather consistently said uh, or viewed the matter in some more legal detail than the others might have. Uh, Mr. Balakrishna of India, on the other hand, uh, was extraordinarily liberal in his willingness to interpret the way possible areas of conflict between our law and Byrne. And the attitude of Mr. Balakrishna, by the way, is, is rather significant since India has always been the leader of the uh, developed countries. And uh, his attitude was also, to a certain extent, shared by Mr. Ndaye from S Senegal, which is also significant since the attitude of the developing countries will be very important as matters progress. The draft report, we haven't yet seen the final report, but the draft report stated in a very carefully worded paragraph. The general view of the group of experts was that the principal, if not the only obstacle to the accession of the United States, would seem to be certain provisions on formalities contained in the U.S. law. As a general statement, I think that's true, but uh, I think you're probably more interested in a point-by-point -point discussion of each provision of our law that, that uh, stood in potential conflict with Byrne. Essentially, the way the meeting progressed was that uh, the register, with some minimal assistance from myself, would go over the U.S. law, and then it would be thrown open to discussion among the Byrne experts as to how they viewed uh, the particular provision of U.S. law and the particular corresponding provision of the Byrne Convention. What I'll try to do now is to summarize on a point-by-point -point basis uh, each provision we discussed uh, without going through it in detail, but just trying to summarize the attitudes and the feelings that developed. The first area we went over was the area of formalities, which developed into the biggest problem. Article 5.1 of the Berne Convention, I'm speaking now of the Paris text of the Berne Convention, provides a certain rights are to be accorded to works originating in other burned countries. And as I said at the beginning, these are two types of rights. First, the rights of national treatment, and second, certain minimum rights granted by the Convention. Article 5.2 of Bern then states that, quote, the enjoyment and exercise of these rights shall not be subject to any formality, close quote. We then proceeded to discuss the formalities that still remained under the existing U.S. law. And there was a general consensus, consensus that the notice provisions were the killer, that the notice provisions as they still remain in U.S. law, the requirement that a notice appear on publicly distribute, distributed copies of a work, or that if the notice is omitted and it's not a small number of copies or not in breach of contract, that a reasonable attempt to add the notice together with the registration has to be made, was viewed as totally incompatible with the prohibition in the Berne Convention on formalities. There was really no one in the room uh, willing to in any way interpret or draw back from the position that uh, our law simply was in total discord with the requirements of Berne on this point. We then proceeded to discuss the question of registration as a formality, and particularly registration as a condition to getting into court. And a split, a rather clearly defined split, occurred among the panel of experts. Several of the experts saw this as not in any way con contradicting the 
prohibition against formalities in Bern. Uh, among them were Barbara and myself. <laughs> the, uh, the theory of this group was essentially that registration as a condition to suit is not a copyright formality. It's, it's a judicial formality, and many Bern countries have such formalities. Before you go into court, certain notarized documents have to be signed, or certain copies have to be made available to the court or complaints have to be filed in specified form, or certain entries have to be made in official dockets. And in essence, we saw registration in the Copyright Office as simply a judicial type of formality rather than a copyright qua copyright formality. And a substantial number of the consultants agreed. On the other hand, uh, several didn't, and these included Mr. Caravera of France and apparently Mr. Ulmer of the Federal Republic. They saw a registration as a condition to suit as a copyright formality. They pointed out that this was not a filing in the court. It was a filing in the Copyright Office. Uh, other than discussions reflecting that split, there's really very little that could be said further about that. Registration as a condition to attorney's fees and statutory damages, uh, as most of you know, if infringement occurs before registration, there is a preclusion on the recovery of statutory damages or attorney's fees unless the infringement occurred within three months after first publication. There was no real discussion of this point, but uh, a general feeling that this was not a problem. Barbara took the position in her statement that attorney's fees and statutory damages are really a bonus given by American law to people who do register. That. Uh, the extraordinary remedy of statutory damages is, is virtually unheard of in any foreign country. And no foreign country grants it to Americans seeking protection of their works abroad. And in this sense, as a bonus, uh, it was not inconsistent with Byrne. And this is basically the way, by the way, that uh, we view registration as a condition to attorney's fees and statutory damages as not inconsistent with the Universal Copyright Convention. And that seems to be accepted. And the, the experts at the Byrne meeting uh, appeared to feel comfortable with that theory. There was very little discussion, in fact, next to none, of registration as a condition to the recovery of mechanical royalties under a compulsory license or registration as a part of the requirements for constructive notice. But there really doesn't appear to be any basis of, of conflict between Byrne and the U.S. law on those points. We then proceeded to a second formality, a uh, third formality under our law, which is recordation. Uh, particularly the fact that under the new law, unlike the old, recordation is now a condition to filing a complaint for infringement. We were rather surprised that uh, Mr. Ulmer, who was, this was all occurred during the first day, and Mr. Ulmer was in the chair, simply waved his hand and dismissed this. And Caravera appeared to agree. This is no, no point of discord with the requirements of Bern, because every country in the Bern Union has some type of requirement of recordation of documents. They have to be in writing, or they have to be filed in a certain place. But I, I really wonder if the people who viewed registration as a condition to suit as a formality, including Omer, uh, really understood that the consequences of failing to record were the same, that if you were anyone other than the North, you couldn't get into court. It seems a little bit difficult to reconcile the two positions, that registration as a condition to sue is a formality, but recordation as a condition to sue is not. I really question whether they understood the consequences of uh, somebody other than the author failing to record the document under which they acquired title. Um, but we were not inclined, uh, nor did we have the time to press the point. We also discussed deposit. Now, deposit as part of registration faced the same problems as registration as a condition to suit, obviously. And those who felt that registration as a condition to suit was incompatible felt that deposit as a part of registration was incompatible. Uh, but no one there was willing to view deposit for the Library of Congress under Section 407 as a point of disharmony or discord. They all seemed to accept the fact that this was simply a application of the French doctrine of uh, dépôt légal was separate from copyright, even though it was in the copyright law, and was not a point of conflict between our law and Bern. And there was 
although we brought up the point at, at two different occasions, there was no discussion of the manufacturing clause. And I don't really think the manufacturing clause is a problem, particularly the new manufacturing clause, uh, which virtually only applies to Americans. The second area we discussed was that of moral rights. Under Article 6 bis of Byrne, it is provided that independently of the author's economic rights, and even after the transfer of said rights, the author shall have the right to claim authorship of the work and to object to any distortion, mutilation, or other modification of, or other derogatory action in relation to the work, which would be prejudicial to his honor or reputation. Uh, the second paragraph states that the rights granted to the author in accordance with that paragraph, that is, the moral rights, shall, after the author's death, be maintained at least until the expiry of the economic rights. That is, any country which granted copyright on a life plus 50 basis would have to maintain moral rights on a life plus 50 basis. There's also another provision in that paragraph which states that certain countries which at the time they joined Bern do not provide for the continued protection of moral rights after death uh, may continue to provide that some of these rights, but not all of them, uh, could cease at the death of the author. And the final paragraph has an interesting word. It says, the means of redress for safeguarding the rights granted by this article shall be governed by the legislation of the country where protection is claimed. Uh, we explained to the assembled experts uh, the position of moral rights under American law, essentially that they're not part of the statutory copyright law. Uh, with the exception of the exclusive right to make new versions of a work, which does have moral rights aspects to it, and the possible use of Section 43A of the Lanham Act uh, <clears throat> under the Monty Python case, moral rights protection in this law to the extent, in this country, to the extent it exists, is a product of the common law. The, it's not called common moral rights, it's called defamation, privacy, right of publicity, unfair competition, misappropriation, libel, slander, and other aspects of defamation. We took the position that we would feel comfortable in going to Congress and saying that the common law as it's developed in the United States to date is sufficient for us to join the Berne Convention. We give enough protection under the common law. The experts seemed comfortable with this. Their attitude was, well, if you think it's enough, uh, we're not going to second guess you. A couple of minor questions uh, may arise in the future, however. Uh, one of the reasons they cannot be too uncomfortable with us is that virtually every country of the Berne Union which has a British law tradition is in the same boat, since most of them do not have moral rights granted under statute, including the UK. But something is happening in Britain at this point which may affect us. They are uncomfortable with their own position under the Berne Convention, particularly the fact that to the extent moral rights protection is granted under the laws of defamation or the right of p privacy, they do not survive the author's death. And Article 6 bis 2 requires that at least some of the rights shall survive the author's death. And the British are now seriously considering a statutory amendment which would recognize moral rights by virtue of positive law and would e extend those rights beyond the, author's de uh, beyond the author's death. If they do that, then we will be under considerable pressure uh, because it might be viewed as a concession by, the, by Britain that their law was not in conformity with Byrne. And if they take steps to enact legislation, it will make it somewhat difficult for us to, not to do so. Another point, which if examined in detail may cause some problem, is one of the moral rights required to be granted under Byrne is the right to claim paternity of the work, the right to be recognized as an author. And if you really examine the case law in the United States, uh, really being emphasized, it's doubtful that that right exists under common law. The cases seem to say that you're not entitled to claim authorship of a work unless you have a contract granting you that right. Without a contract, uh, the right does not exist. <coughs> and third, uh, some commentators have pointed to the word I mentioned in Article 6, bit, bit 3, the word legislation, that the rights granted by this article shall be governed by the legislation of the country where protection is claimed. And there were some commentators, although no one uh, represented the meeting, who said legislation means legislation and not common law. <coughs> 
And uh, when this argument is raised, the traditional answer is, but look at Britain. And one of the rebuttals given to that is, but Britain was a member of Bern before the text was drafted in such a way as to adopt the word legislation. And it was never the intent of any revision of the Bern Convention to force any member out of the convention. Uh, putting those all together, I think what's going to happen is the same thing that happened at the meeting. We'll probably still feel comfortable going to Congress if the occasion should arise and saying, we have enough common law protection of moral rights that we think we can port with the Bern Convention. And if we do so, uh, nobody in Bern will second guess us. If we were to join Bern, uh, what would probably happen, and this is viewed as one of the beneficial results of our joining Bern by everyone except the motion, motion picture and television industries, is that there would be greater pressure on our courts to grant greater moral rights because we would be a member of a convention which referred to them. The next area of law that we discussed had to do with the duration of copyright. Article 7.1 of the Paris Text of Berne requires that the term of protection shall be the life of the author plus 50 years after that author's death. It then provides special rules for cinematographic works. I never try to pronounce that more than once in the same speech. And uh, some other special words for anonymous and pseudonymous works. Obviously, our new law with respect to most works, Life Plus 50, is in total harmony with Byrne. The question was discussed about our provisions for anonymous, pseudonymous works and works made for hire. There was really no question that our provisions for anonymous and pseudonymous works was acceptable. Uh, but Mr. Kavair expressed strong reservations about our rule on works made for hire. Uh, the French legal tradition is and always has been, very tied up with the idea that copyright is the right of the individual author, not an employing entity, not a corporation, not a partnership, but the individual who created it. Uh, at this point, Mr. Ulmer was gone, and his views will be very significant, but a day earlier he had indicated some sympathy with Mr. Caravere's views, that the works made for higher provision uh, was a problem. It took us there was a lot of discussion at this point simply because it took us a considerable amount of time to explain to them that uh, we were talking not only about ownership but about duration. Uh, Mr. DeSanctis, uh, in his wonderful manner, lectured everybody for an hour and a half on the fact that many burning countries have special rules on works created by employees, and many burning countries uh, grant the ownership of those rights to the employing bodies. and. Uh, Unfortunately, that's not the point. It's not ownership, it's duration. And uh, he gave a long speech on the fact that if there were to be a work made for hire and if the employee were to contractually reserve the rights and register the work in the U.S. Copyright Office in the employee's name, everything would be fine. Uh, right, Mrs. Ringer, at which point uh, Ms. Ringer said, <laughs> no, wrong. Uh, a work made for hire is a work made for hire even if the employee retains ownership, it remains a work made for hire for the purposes of duration. Unless the contract retaining ownership was such as to say this was not created within the scope of that person's employment, at which point uh, you could also change the rules on duration. Well, we went round and round and round on this, and I think they finally understood it, but still the general tendency uh, was uh, works made for hire are a special species of, of animal. Every burn country does something particular with them, and the fact that the U.S. makes some special durational provision from them is uh, no real problem, particularly since in the case of motion pictures, remember I never say cinematographic more than once, especially in the case of motion pictures, the Berne Convention itself recognizes exceptions. The, uh, if, you're, if you're looking for, you know, concrete solutions, you're not going to get them from me because the, the meeting really didn't resolve any. I'm just trying to convey the tone of what, of what transpired. The next area that arose was, at least academically, the most fascinating because some of the uh, creative solutions that were put forward by uh, some of the experts who were very much interested in the United States joining Byrne. This is the problem of retroactivity. We went there thinking that retroactivity would be a big problem for us. Uh, 
the, uh, the issue arises because of Article 18 of the Berne Convention. And to explain this, it may be helpful to go back and look at the way it works in the, uh, in the UCC. When we joined the UCC, there was really no problem of retroactivity because the rule of retroactivity under the Universal Convention states that if a work is permanently in the public domain in the country where protection is sought, it remains in the public domain. In other words, uh, when we joined the UCC, all the French works, German works, British works, Italian works, which were in the USPD because they were published without notice before the uh, Universal Convention, remained there. They were permanently in the public domain in the country where protection is sought, that is, the United States. Anyone seeking protection of those works in the United States would run up against the fact that they were PD in the forum country and therefore under the UCC did not have to be resurrected. The rule under Berne is quite different. The basic rule of the Berne Convention is that it applies to all works which at the time the convention comes into force have not yet fallen into the PD in the country of origin through the expiration of the term of protection. Country of origin, not the country where protection is sought. If this were the only provision of burn, and someone were to come into the United States after we joined burn, and sought to protect a French work or a German work or a British work, which was in the American public domain from unauthorized translation, and that work was still protected in Britain or France, as the case may be, because uh, the term of protection in that country hadn't expired, and most of them wouldn't. Uh, being based on life of the U.S. during 50 years, this rule says, since it hasn't fallen into the public domain in the country of origin, the country where protection is sought, has to continue to protect it. Uh, this creates obvious practical difficulties. What about all the translations that have been made in, of these public domain works all these years without anyone being paid? And there are those, uh, probably including Professor Nimmer, who would take the view that it's unconstitutional to take those works out of the public domain that it violates the limited time clause of the Constitution. Well, we went, as I said, we went into the meeting thinking that this would be a major problem. Uh, but it turned out not to be, uh, because, as I indicated, some very creative uh, theories were applied. After setting forth the rule I just mentioned, the Convention goes on to say that now, let me skip a paragraph. Two paragraphs later states that the application of this principle, that is the principle of retroactivity, shall be subject to any provisions contained in special conventions to that effect existing or to be concluded between countries of the Union, which means that if you make a special deal with each country of the Union, you don't have to apply this principle. Well, a special deal with every country of the Berne Union seemed out of the question. However, the Director General of WIPO suggested that since it says shall be subject to any provisions contained in special conventions to that effect, that this included the Universal Copyright Convention. And that therefore any burned country which is also a member of the UCC and shares UCC relationships with the United States has concluded a special treaty, i.e. the UCC, which says you don't have to apply the burn rule. Uh, this would leave still a number of burned countries who are not members of the UCC uh, not taken care of, but the theory is we could conclude special treaties with those countries, saying that we would not have to apply the convention retroactively. Uh, there was no definite commitment to either of these solutions, but uh, nobody scoffed at it. The other theory that was put forward, and, and perhaps of, of greater interest, is uh, was put forward uh, Interestingly enough, the basis for it was put forward by Mr. Caravere and it was taken forward by Mr. Balakrishna. They pointed to the second paragraph of Article 18, which says that if through the expiration of the term of protection which was previously granted, a work has fallen into the public domain of the country where protection is sought, the work shall not be protected anew. In other words, if we did protect the work, a French work, a German work, an Italian work, and it failed of renewal, or 56 years had passed, this provision would not require us to protect it again. So although the basic rule is if it's protected in the country of origin, you protect it. The Convention modifies that by saying if you did protect it, you don't have to protect it anew if the term you granted has expired. Well, the basic theory that approached here was that before publication, all of these works were protected because the common law protected the works of all foreign nationals. And therefore, there was a term of protection 
granted to all these works, which at the moment of publication expired when they were published without notice. Uh, if you look at the history of the Berne Convention and the purpose of this provision, it, it simply doesn't wash. Uh, because at the time this provision was written, the Berne Convention only applied really to published works, and there was really no intent uh, to apply this principle in this manner. On the other hand, there was a substantial body of opinion at the meeting who said this is the way we can interpret it and this is the way to move any inconsistency between the United States and the Berne Convention. Uh, and far be it from us to say that was ridiculous. <laughs> The second aspect of retroactivity caused less of a problem. Uh, if the retroactive, retroactive principle were, were applied literally, uh, we were in trouble with the earlier, the pre-January 1, 1978 works, which are not protected for life plus 50 as required by Byrne, but are protected under our old rules of 28 and 28, and now 28 and 47, subject to renewal. The, uh, this was generally viewed uh, to be no problem whatsoever, uh, but, and that, but to be justified under the provision that in the absence of such provisions, that is, special conventions between countries, the respective countries shall determine each and so far as is concerned the conditions of application of this principle. And the experts said, well, under the provision that each country can determine the conditions under which it will apply the principle of retroactivity, you can have certain special transitory rules for pre-January 1, 1978 works. The real question, uh, the real issue was whether that paragraph, the uh, right of each country to determine the conditions of application of the principle, could be interpreted in such a way as to let the United States fully and completely abrogate the principle and refuse to protect any earlier works, and it was generally agreed that we couldn't do so, subject to this rather unique theory of uh, the works having had a term of protection in the U.S. under the common law and that term having expired. We then uh, proceeded to try to discuss uh, the protection of works of architecture in the United States. The uh, Berne Convention does include works of architecture as an example of a literary, scientific, or artistic work which shall be protected. Uh, we went through the provisions of the new law dealing with industrial designs and gave some explanation about how it operates. And the general judgment of all those concerned, I think can best be described in that, that uh, great Italian gesture, uh, eh. <laughs> That's pretty much uh, the extent of the discussion of architectural works. <laughs> eh, maybe, maybe not, you know. Uh, Jutebox seemed to be, uh, and we thought would be, a major problem. Under the Berne Convention, the public performance of musical compositions, there is no provision for compulsory licensing of the public performance of musical compositions. No. Uh, Mr. Balakrishna of India was willing to take the view that since it says you can't, since it doesn't say you can't subject them to compulsory licensing, that means we can, but nobody else really bought that theory. Uh, but there was a general tendency not to view our compulsory license for jukebox as a major problem on a couple of grounds. First of all, everybody viewed it as a problem that, that sooner or later is going to disappear. Uh, jukeboxes won't be around that long. There are not that many of them. Uh, licensing division people take note. Uh, Bosch started raising the major issue of what happens when you satellites replace jukeboxes and when you can dial a number on your home screen and get music to it. But it turned out that didn't. Uh, meet the definition of a jukebox anyway, because you don't insert coins to activate a satellite. <laughs> but the, there was a legal theory put forward, particularly by William Wallace of Great Britain, which a lot of the experts were willing to accept. And the point was this, that the countries of the Berne Union have all expressly reserved the right to control monopolies and to adopt domestic legislation controlling monopolies. And since the public performance of music on the jukebox is something that in every country is exercised through performing rights societies rather than through individual authors, that our compulsory license for jukebox could be viewed merely as a device intended to control the potential monopolistic practices of the performing rights societies rather than as a copyright control device. In other words, we set a fee so that these monopolistic organizations such as ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC cannot go their merry way. And uh, 
most of the members of the meeting were willing to accept that. Although uh, Mr. Caravere and Frank Keyes and Ivor Davis of the uh, United Kingdom and England were, were rather concerned about this type of interpretation. And Caravere said, no matter what you say, it's a, a compulsory license. And uh, Davis and Keyes were saying, well, you know, we don't really think it's a problem, but uh, it is a compulsory license, even if you call it an anti-monopoly anti statute. The most that could be said on jukebox is then that some of the members still think it, some of the experts still think it's a problem, but there was this sort of general feeling blowing in the wind that uh, it's not a real killer, and if this were the only point of uh, departure, it was something that everybody could sort of feel comfortable uh, looking the other way from on the grounds of the anti-monopoly theory. We also uh, reviewed briefly for the members the uh, panoply of small exceptions contained in Section 110 and 111A of the statute, uh, which grant outright exemptions, not compulsory licenses, uh, from performing rights. The general attitude here was that these are small matters, in the words of one of the experts. And if you examine the views of most burn countries, you'll find here and there uh, small exceptions which aren't directly recognized in the Berne Convention dealing with such matters as performances in schools, uh, performances by passive carriers uh, like telephone companies, and translators, boosters, or the like. And there was no real feeling that any of that would be a problem. Uh, we then <laughs> explained to them Section 111 of the law, 111C, uh, dealing with the compulsory license for cable operations. We did not think this would be a problem because uh, the Berne Convention distinguishes between public performance and broadcasting, whereas we view broadcasting as an aspect of public performance. And the provision of the Berne Convention, which deals with the exclusive right to control the broadcast of a work, specifically admits of compulsory licensing. It says that countries can modify that proposal, so the exclusive right, so long as the author is assured just economic compensation. On those grounds, we really felt we were rather secure saying it's a compulsory license. The author is entitled to adequate compensation under the statute, and therefore, since this is recognized by Byrne, there's no real problem. Uh, but Mr. Caravere, insisting that he was only raising an issue and not alleging incompatibility, uh, pointed to the particular wording of the Byrne Convention, which said that you can have this type of compulsory license uh, provided you assure adequate compensation provided the parties were unable to agree. And he suggested this means that you always have to have negotiation first, and only if negotiation fails on a face-to-face -face basis can you apply compulsory licensing. Nobody was, else was really willing to interpret the, the convention that way. Even Caravere probably uh, wouldn't hold to that literally. And even if pushed to it, we could, I think, point to the history of cable in this country and, and validly say that face-to-face -face negotiation was tried and simply didn't work. It's the reason it took 12 years to get a bill. That was, uh, as I mentioned before, there was really no discussion of manufacturing clause, and the, the formality of renewal came up in the question of retroactivity as a matter of term, and nobody thought that was incompatible. incompatible. At the last session of the meeting, uh, Dr. Bosch, the Director General, put forward a potential solution, which he had obviously been uh, sending signals at all three days. He, he calls it a bridge between the Berne Convention and the UCC. The unfortunate thing was that this was put forward at a time when Mr. Ulmer had left, Mr. Caravere was no longer there, and Ivor Davis had uh, to return to Britain. So we really didn't get their reaction. The uh, Bosch's proposal is that the Berne Convention accept a protocol, a special attachment, which would provide an effect that any country which at the moment it joins the Berne Convention is a member of the Universal Copyright Convention, but which is not a member of the Berne Convention and never has been a member of the Berne Convention, and guess who fits that category, <laughs> can instead of Article 5 of the Berne Convention, prohibiting formalities, apply Article 3 of the Universal Copyright Convention, which permits the use of the C in the circle notice to satisfy formality. 
<clears throat> under the protocol, this could be done for a period of blank number of years. When Bosch first talked to us about it privately, he was talking about 25 years. He later talked about 20 years. If at the expiration of that term, the country, parents, the United States, close parents, hasn't <laughs> modified its law to get rid of notice, then it would have to withdraw from the convention, from the Berne Convention. Uh, we pointed out that the protocol would have to have one more provision. If it were left at that point and we were to leave the Berne Convention after 20 years because we couldn't get rid of notice, uh, we could also not fall back on the UCC because there is a protective provision in the Universal Copyright Convention, in the Appendix Declaration, which states that if a country pulls out of Bern, it can't rely on the UCC to uh, govern its relations with other Bern countries who are members of the UCC. Uh, this was put in during the uh, period of great hassle with the developing countries, and it was feared that a large number of countries would leave Bern and rely on the UCC. Uh, so the protocol would also adopt the principle that uh, any country falling into this category which had to leave the Berne Convention after the stated number of years could still rely on the UCC in its relations with other Berne countries. Uh, everyone, with the exception of those who weren't there, the three I mentioned, was then polled as to whether they thought this should be further studied, not as to whether they thought it was a good idea. And every uh, delegate there uh, applauded the Director General for his wisdom and said, yes, this is something which should be further studied uh, by the Berne Bureau. And the indications that were that even Ivor Davis, who was not there, uh, would also go ahead with the idea of further studying it. And I, I imagine that neither Caravere nor Omer would say it's not something which should be studied further. Uh, one condition was put on the question of further study, and that was that WIPO received a letter from the United States saying that they were interested in the possibility, and we've since sent such a letter. What, happened ne what happens next? Uh, really will take place in three different arenas. Uh, the first is within WIPO itself, within the World Intellectual Property Organization. Uh, since we have sent the letter saying the United States is interested, the next step will be for Dr. Bosch to take the matter to the, Bern, to the Bern Executive Committee and recommend that it be further studied by a more fully developed panel, including representatives of countries rather than individual experts, representatives of the non-governmental organizations such as CISAC, which is where we expect problems to arise, and uh, the way the report is worded, including the United States as an interested observer. The, uh, the other arena in which developments will have to occur is, is, is here at home. Uh, there is no great expression of uh, interest in this country for the possibility of our adhering to the, United, to the uh, Berne Convention. When discussions occur in the private sector, a lot of things go back and forth. I, I'll just give you a, a brief catalog of some of them. Uh, the motion picture industry and the television companies have for years been the prime opponents of our joining the Berne Convention. They, are, they have been in the past very much afraid of the obligation to respect moral rights. They feel that this will interfere with their ability to modify novels for television and motion picture use. The, uh, they've really, to my knowledge, never been able to answer the point that uh, there happen to be television and motion picture industries in France, Germany, Italy, Spain, and other members of the Berne Convention. Uh, some ten years ago, uh, Mel Nimmer was commissioned by WIPO to do a special study on this, and notwithstanding the fact that uh, he has long been a uh, representative of motion picture interests, came out with the conclusion that the motion picture industry had nothing to fear. Since moral rights could be alienable or subject to transfer by contract under the Berne Convention, all a motion picture company or television company had to do was provide in its contract that they had the right to modify the work, they had the right to omit screen credit or the like, and that they could continue the modif to exploit works the way they always had. Uh, but for years, this simply didn't pay off. The television people and the motion picture people were constantly opposed for a ratification of Berne. Uh, we had a meeting at the State Department of the International Advisory Panel some 
weeks before we went to Geneva, and we were rather pleasantly surprised to find out that uh, at least Sidney Schreiber, representing the Motion Picture Association, seemed to say that his people were now willing to support the Berne Convention, because without it they were getting ripped off in every country of the globe. Uh, uh, the sheiks in the oil-rich lands were getting pirate prints made. Uh, companies were sending pirate prints to uh, American oil employees working on pipelines in all these countries, and they felt that the Berne Convention could actually help them rather than hurt them. Uh, Bob Hadel, representing some of the major motion picture companies and television production companies, was not as positive in his attitude, but was hardly as negative if, as people like uh, Bob Evans and others had been in the past. So things look a little optimistic on those grounds. But the real discussion that traditionally arises in this area is how much do we have to gain from it? And if you look at it from a purely legal standpoint, I guess you could say the United States or copyright interest in the United States don't have a hell of a lot to gain. Uh, almost every country of major significance is now a member of the Universal Copyright Convention. Many of those countries are also a member of Bern. When they became members of Bern, they had to revise their law in conformity with Bern and grant higher level of protection than they might otherwise have done. They had to give Life Plus 50, they had to give broadcasting rights, they had to give exclusive public performance rights. And when they modified their law to conform to Bern, they applied it to all foreign works, whether originating in a Bern country or a UCC country. So in effect, we're getting Bern protection now in all Bern countries, which are also members of the UCC. Every once in a while, there's a quirk. Uh, there's a strange situation in Japan. Japan is probably the one country that I know of, and we found this every once in a while uh, with a client, where you were worse off under Bern than you were under the UCC, because they had strange translation provisions. You could actually find that if you claim simultaneous publication of a work to bring you under protection of the Berne Convention in Japan, you had no translation rights whatsoever, whereas if you hadn't admitted it was simultaneously published and you claimed protection only under the UCC, you had full translation rights. With that exception, though, we get the benefit of Berne protection in every major Berne country that's a member of the UCC. The, uh, the next point generally brought out is that there are very few countries which are not members of the Universal Copyright Convention, which are members of Bern. I think there is something like between 9 and 11 countries, and when you go through the list, they are not, in terms of market significance, uh, important countries. Uh, whenever I've heard this argument, I've always given a, a standard answer, and it seems to have at least uh, swayed Sidney Schreiber and some of the motion picture people and some of the book publishers, and that is you can't only worry about whether a foreign country is an important potential market. The real question is whether it's a potential source of piracy. You may have a country with a, a population of 300 who speak some vague dialect which no one understands and never expect to sell your books there. But if that country imports photocopying machines or printing presses and starts knocking off your works and then exporting them to every country close to it, then you've got a major problem. Uh, during all those years when Taiwan was a, a major book pirate, I don't think the American publishers feel, fear the great loss of sale of their encyclopedias in Taiwan. What they were afraid of was the fact that they were all coming back to college students in the U.S. and being sold for half price. So the problem is not so much that there are burned, the point is not so much that there are burned countries who don't belong to the U.S., but that they are not important potential markets. I think the answer to that is that they may be important potential sources of infringement and exportation. And if, if that point is accepted, then there may well be substantial benefits in, in, in joining Bern. Other ways people go back and forth on this is, well, it's traditional to say the burn off is the high standard of protection that has never been offered by the UCC, uh, to which answer is frequently given that since the concessions made to developing countries in 1961 that uh, burn is no higher in practice than the UCC, which is probably wrong. I think if you look at the conventions, uh, burn still does guarantee more rights than uh, the UCC does at this point. Another argument made by some American interests is that we don't need it. We can always and always have been able to get burn protection through the back door, simultaneously publish in a burn country, and we're protected. That's true in theory, but I think most American interests recognize the fact that what they've been doing for the last 40 years, if challenged in a court in a burn country, would really not pass muster as a simultaneous publication. Uh, 
particularly under the later text of the Berne Convention, which defines publication as making a sufficient number of quantities available to the public. And when the American publisher sends one copy of a book to a warehouse in Ottawa and sits back and says, well, we've simultaneously published in Canada, I don't think they really believe that that would pass muster if ever tested in the Berne country. Music people have been much more cautious. A lot of music publishers send multiple copies of sheet music up to Canada put it on sale in a Canadian bookstore, have affidavits executed by Canadian uh, music sh sheet music publishers and, and book publishers. Uh, the American book publishing industry hasn't been that cautious. Another problem is that when you use Canada, first of all, you're, you're violating Canadian law. Uh, everything American publishers have done for the last 30 years in Canada has been illegal. Uh, there's a <laughs> That's an overstatement, but there's a provision in, in, in Canadian law which states that it is illegal to import books into Canada within 14 days of their first publication abroad. Uh, the reason it was put in there is, was clearly to stop American publish from, publishers from using Canada as a source of simultaneous publication before the UCC. They were getting fed up with us. They said, you want the benefits of Burn, join Burn. We're not going to let you use Canada as a source of simultaneous publication. However, the provision has never been enforced by Canadian customs authorities. Uh, so there, there is an academic problem. Some attorneys say they caution their clients if they're really interested in simultaneous publication. Yeah, there are better countries than Canada because someday the argument is going to be made that since this was illegal under Canadian law, whether enforced by Canadian customs or not, uh, an, illegal, an illegal act is always, remain, is always and remains a nullity. Therefore, it was not a publication. Another problem with Canada is that it has never joined the later text of the Berne Convention, which defines simultaneous publication as publication within 30 days. There are members of earlier texts of the Berne Convention which just use the word simultaneous publication and don't define it. Uh, the question has always been, does that mean publication has to be literally simultaneous on the same day? Uh, nobody really knows the answer. There was a case involving the Charlie Chaplin film about four years ago which said that simultaneous publication uh, was not a literal requirement to simultaneity as long as it was part of the same transaction. But other than that case, we really don't know. Uh, putting it all together, then, simultaneous publication, at least where you don't make a large number of quantities available uh, within pretty close temporal proximity, is a risky basis upon which to argue that we already have the benefits of burn. Some years ago, uh, the question arose in the Netherlands, and uh, the Dutch just got fed up with the United States. And the same attitude as the Canadians had when they put that provision in their law. If you want to become a member of Bern, join Bern. Don't try back door. And they threw gone with the wind into the public domain in the Netherlands on the grounds that it was not effectively simultaneous, simultaneously published. Uh, another case involved a similar result with an article in Collier's Magazine, I believe. But I think maybe the best answer to those who argue that uh, we're entitled to all the advantages of Bern under the backdoor approach anyway is probably also the, the basic reason we should join Bern if we should. And it's not a legal reason, it's a practical one. And that is, for a country like the United States, uh, a great world power, a great exporter, maybe we're not a great world power anymore, a massive exporter of intellectual works to sneak into uh, the major international convention through backdoor publication uh, and backdoor activities is just politically and practically close to intolerable. It looks bad, it tastes bad, it smells bad. Uh, the, results will be, the results will be felt when litigation arises. That may be the same reason why we should join Bern. All the problems we're facing in this country right now, all the problems of photocopying, satellite transmission, cable retransmission, educational uses, off-the-air video recording, sooner or later are being or will be felt on the international scene, and they'll be investigated at an international level. And when you participate in investigations as an observer, as we're now forced to do in Bern meetings, rather than as a direct participant, uh, you're really not in the position uh, to influence or fully participate in those deliberations. If we really want to become part of the world international copyright community, the uh, the best way to do it probably would be to join both Burn, remain members of the UCC and join Burn. And I think that's probably the line that uh, we're taking now, although there is no official government line at this point. And there will be other benefits. One of the great benefits uh, 
under the protocol that Bosch suggested would be there will be tremendous pressure on the United States after that period of, say, 20 years to get rid of notice. Uh, the idea of joining a convention and then getting out is something most countries don't like to do. And uh, the Register has gone public with the idea that uh, at some point in the future we should consider dropping notice out of the United States copyright law. Uh, the librarians are not very happy with this and won't be. Uh, but if you view uh, getting rid of notice as a positive uh, end in terms of copyright law, then that will be another advantage of joining Byrne under the protocol suggested by the Director General, namely that it will put tremendous pressure on Congress to get rid of notice. Uh, amen. Thank you very much. Any questions? Thank you. David has a question. Well, I, I suspect some people will say, why do we need this bill? And our answer will be that it will be a more formal codification of moral rights. Yeah, but uh, I don't think we're going to be faced with going to Congress in the immediate future and, and, and raising with Congress our compatibility with, uh, with the Berne Convention or not, and the, the fate of the Dryden Bill might be uh, decided even before that happens. Lewis? We didn't get them formally or informally for UNESCO because they weren't represented. And obviously, there is a uh, an area of tension between WIPO and UNESCO, two specialized agencies of the United Nations dealing with the same subject matter. Uh, Bosch views this proposal as a bridge, something to bring the two conventions closer together. Now, obviously, uh, at some point in the future, WIPO would prefer that if the conventions move closer together, that the, the one that finally emerges would be administered by WIPO rather than UNESCO. And UNESCO feels the opposite way. Uh, the effect of this proposal, I suspect, will be to uh, raise some questions in the minds of the people at UNESCO when they really fit, sit down to look at it, but that they were not represented at the meeting. <laughs>